Hello, welcome back. It's Jacob, it's learning. Let's go to school. We're going to try some practice writing lesson one. This is really for high school or uh, college level. Here's some information here about the poem, I am Joaquin. And um, these are, this is R Rodolfo Corte Gonzalez. And this is him earlier. Unfortunately, he died in 2005. This is one of my favorite poems because it caused me to go back and look at the history of the Aztec um, civilization and also to look back at um, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. There are still things traded and exported out of there, silver, silk, coffee, tea, obviously, and let's look at things. Um, we're going to hear some language in this poem. It's not necessarily the reflection of the authors or of the essay, but we have to take what Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez wrote, and we have to go ahead and use it in terms of what happened with history. We also have to do it without blaming anybody, and we have to listen to how Mr. Gonzalez tried to take his sorrow, his fear, and his anger and turn it into a beautiful poem about a person who has a lot of different perspectives and his conflict, uh, even though he has conflict. So you have here, I am Joaquin, lost in a world of confusion, caught up in a world of of a gringo society, confused by the rules, scorned by the attitudes, suppressed by manipulations, and destroyed by modern society. My fathers have lost the economic battle and won the struggle of cultural survival, and now I must choose between the paradox of victory of the spirit despite physical hunger, or to exist in the grasp of the American social neurosis, sterilization of the soul, and a full stomach. Yes, I have come a long way to nowhere. Unwillingly dragged by that monstrous technical industrial giant called progress and success. I look at myself, I watch my brothers, I shed tears of sorrow, I sow seeds of hate, I withdraw to the safety within the circle of my of life, of my own people. I am Kuhaltimuk, proud and noble labor of men king of an empire, civilized beyond the dreams of the Gauchapin Cortez, who also is the blood, the image of myself. I am the Maya prince. I am this Hulkulti, great leader of the Chichi Mecas. I am the sword and the flame of Cortez the despot, and I am the eagle and the serpent of the Aztec civilization. I own the land as far as the eye could see under the crown of Spain, and I toiled on earth and gave my Indian sweat and the blood of the Spanish master, who ruled with tyranny over man and beast and all that he could trample. But the ground was mine. I was both tyrant and slave. As, Christ, as the Christian church took its place in God's good name, to take and use my virgin strength and trusting faith, the priests, both good and bad, took but. And this poem continues, but since we're on this page, uh, we've already gotten to stanza six, and I'm not going to read all 22 stanzas uh, of the poem, but I wanted to get into the introduction so you could see that he stated here who he is, and I guess this is symbolism that Mr. Gonzalez used <laughs> to say, you know, I'm this person. Uh, and I'm both lost, confused, but I have a victory of the spirit. Kind of a contradiction there that I'm lost and confused, but I'm still trying to have victory of the spirit despite physical hunger. He was conquered, yet he is the Mayan prince. He shed tears of sorrow. He said, I sow seeds of hate. Seeds of hate is a metaphor. We just grow with anger. Uh, we hope no one sows with seeds of hate. And this word here is not something he did because if you read the history, and this is a picture of Mr. Gonzalez Young. This is a picture of him. He was a world-class boxer. And he, he really didn't do hateful things. 
Um, he did a lot of things for civil rights. He brought awareness. He was not violent, but he's speaking about, you know, probably another speaker that did sow seeds of hate with, but yet contained them and didn't go out and act on them. Um, he come down, he says, the ground was mine. I was both tyrant and slave. This is an oxymoron, a contradiction, because you can't literally at the same time be both the slave and the tyrant. You can be the slave who becomes the tyrant. You can be a tyrant who becomes a slave. But like He's like, I'm both. You know, I'm kind of both at the same time. He also says he is a sword and flame of Cortez, the despot, which is, I am, I am the sword and flame of that. I am this thing. Similes and like or as. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and say it's more of a metaphor, but we'll keep that there. He's saying, I am this. I am a sword, which represents fighting. I am a flame, meaning I can be both angry and put out. And so now we can go and get into the writing. Um, rather than read 22 stanzas, I'm going to go on ahead and just get into writing. And I want you to notice that I'm trying as much as possible to keep tenses the same. And I'm going to use some of the words that he used in his poem. And for those of you who want to learn more about this poem, you can download it. Uh, it's free. I, I got this one from the Denver Public Library, although there's a book on it on Amazon. But he starts out very strong by saying, I am Joaquin, lost in a world of confusion, caught up in a world of a gringo society. And so I started out kind of strong and said, I am Joaquin, which is a poem which reflected the effects of the Aztecs losing their civilization. This literary analysis of I am Joaquin reflected the symbolism and reasons Rodolfo Gonzalez wrote the poem. Now we're getting into answering these questions over here, because we always have to keep in mind that we're going to think about the significance and how does the speaker, the author, not necessarily Rodolfo Cortez, although he's a great writer, but how does the speaker express himself throughout the poem? And we, we read this. And so I'm going to go in and say what I'm going to do as a writer based on what Rodolfo Gonzalez wrote. To explain the poem, Gonzalez uses the theme of the conquered versus the conqueror. Gonzalez displayed the theme through metaphors, similes, oxymorons, and tropes. And tro tropes are just uh, like a word symbol like uh, he used uh, Pancho Villa in the poem and Pancho Villa is both a, was both a real person and a fighter for Mexican in independence against Spain but also he becomes a trope meaning that he represents heroism so let's go into the use of metaphors began in the first stanza Gonzalez wrote lost in a world of confusion as an expression of how a person became lost due to the conquest of the Aztec civilization Stanza two began with the word social neurosis. These words were preludes to the next line of stanza two, progress and Anglo success, which indicated that progress in one area caused sorrow and Anglo in another area. This, is, this was Gonzalez's first use of an oxymoron in the poem. And these areas indicated that progress to Anglo-America was a nemesis to the Aztecs. Clearly, the theme of the conqueror versus the conquered is supported with this oxymoron. And when we use this word here, we have to be careful because they're talking about Spanish here. But they're using the word Anglo, which we should know by now. But um, a lot of this stuff went on on what is now our current America. But at the time, you know, Mexico was fighting to get away from Spain, and Spain owed parts of America. And Mexico, before that, said we're going to be part away from Spain, and then had to turn around and fight to get away from us. So, you know, I never met Mr. Gonzalez, but maybe this is... Uh, this might be something that he's addressing. But anyway, we just we just use this here. We use his literal words here 
because we only know the history from reading the history and we're trying to attack it, to attack the, the writing based on what someone described. And by the way, I used to teach uh, English and writing and still do. So this is one of the things that I expect. Okay, I would, I would ask people to guide them to, to make sure you hit these points. So we have to go over this. Write about how the speaker author describes himself. Okay, and he starts from the beginning um, about who he is. And then he comes back and says he was the, I read to you, he was uh, the Mayan emperor. We're going to get into that. But he also has a problem of being caught in a world of confusion. And he had this here, social neurosis. And he put here, he's lost in a world of confusion. So he's telling you I'm kind of lost, okay? So we can check this off, because we did this. Um, write about how the poem explains people who the golf is referring. Okay, well, he's describing Joaquin. So that might seem redundant, but that's what he's doing. Write about how the poem explains the history of the people whom the author is describing. Okay, we got into that over here. Aztec civilization. How do you know this? You only know if it's the Aztec civilization based on the, the words. You can Google search and look them up. All of these words, Maya Prince, um, Kuaha, Tamuk, all of those people. You know, we go back to history. There are some more in stanzas. You know, uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe, you know, you have those. He brings all this stuff up. Montezuma, um, you know, going back to the very, very history, 1300s, <laughs> sorry, beginning, and then conquering and getting away from, you know, Spain a little bit in the 1800s. But anyway. Uh, Gonzalez shared the conqueror and the conquered as opposing ideas of the same action. The ground was mine at the beginning of stanza six, Rodolfo Gonzalez wrote, I was both a tyrant and slave to explain that the Aztecs were at one time leaders. Aztecans were leaders and builders of a mighty civilization, yet the Aztecs were reduced to slavery. And this is a vivid stance on a perspective. This perspective served as a contradiction, and in stanza six, Gonzalez penned the trusting faith and the priests who took advantage of him, and him, a place in quotations, because him, this word, does not literally refer just to Joaquin. This word is broader this word is a representation of people. And he makes reference to men who were conquered, who were noble leaders, and he keeps it kind of gender, he keeps it kind of gender specific. And so, but him also becomes representation so you have here him, and I put in quotations, referred to both Joaquim, who is a descendant of the Aztecans, and to the Aztecans as a group. Thus Joaquim transcended into more than a name. Joaquim becomes an ephemeral trope, which symbolized the conquest of the Aztecan male in Central America and parts of North America. So if you read this, we are building what we're doing. Uh, this is in a stanza that you didn't see, but it is on stanza seven. It says, I was part of the blood and spirit of the courageous village, village priest, explained the premise of stanza seven. It's a beginning. And he's both the blood and the spirit of a village priest is making reference to a real person. And we'll get into that. But now you have this blood and spirit here. A lot, oops, sorry. You have blood and spirit here along with, along with the courageous village priest. And 
another oxymoron that discussed the fact that the village priest became the cry of hurts or el grito de dolores and this is really something if you look it up online it really occurred and it refers to mexican independence so i mean mr gonzalez did an excellent job of bringing up things that really happen and turning them into metaphors and tropes uh to help us understand um what happened to mexican and mexican americans Gonzalez connected a village priest with bloodshed during the Aztecan conquest. The crown, which is used in this stanza two, which is also stanza, I'm sorry, stanza seven, refers to the crown of Spain. And that crown was Queen Isabella and her tyranny, which led to the conquest. The priests in the stanza symbolized religion, which should protect them. I should say, which should have protected them. Instead, the people were murdered. Gonzalez turned Miguel Hidalgo and Pancho Villa into tropes. These persons were real heroes who still symbolize heroism and originators of Mexican independence. The poem used names of other famous people and he used an area where Mexicans were murdered. The altars of Montezuma, I stained a bloody red. Let's take a look at this. This sentence, this, this is a sentence from Sansa seven. It's both an irony or coincidence, because here I'm going to explain, explain what an irony is, which demonstrated respect and disrespect to the grandson of the Aztec emperor, Husuitl, if the speaker, a Mexican man, stains the altars of this leader, the reader hears disrespect. However, Gonzalez depicted the intensity of the Mexican independence and the bloodshed, the bloodshed, which is bloody red, was left on the altar due to the need to fight for independence. Yet the blood should not be left on an altar, which represents holiness. The sacred name of an altar of Montezuma should be preserved, and blood should not stain this altar, especially blood so red that it is bloody red. Bloody red indicated extreme redness, and it indicates completely anyway, but it, it indicated in this Okay, so I am Joaquin, concluded with Rodolfo Gonzalez's assessment of the speaker's strength. Although Aztecs were conquered, his last paragraph, we start to move La Raza, Hispano, Chicano, or whatever I call myself, I look the same. I feel the same, I cry and sing the name, I am the masses of the people, and I refuse to be absorbed. This last stanza summarized Gonzalez's intention. So we're summarizing what happened here. I am the race of Hispanics or Chicanos, regardless of what speakers of what the speaker self-described himself. He has not been broken due to bloodshed. He is walking, and he decided to use, this was from a prior stanza, the smell of chili verde and soft brown eyes to regain his self-esteem. His expectations for a better future remain the same. Although he is hurt, his words are hidden and disguised. So to beat the odds with a strong spirit, I am Joaquin has been an emotional and unfortunately true poem which allowed readers to hear the sadness and determination of the descendants of the Aztecs. Rodolfo Gonzalez used figurative language to describe the unfortunate truth of these historical events. This is part, this is the last part, and you will see a couple of the words used in stanzas in the next slides. And this is just the first part where we kind of wrote for you but in the next writing lessons, and based on those of you who submit comments, okay, if you submit comments to us, we will write along with you to help you gain how you can get these words out. Thank you for watching.
these are references here. That's what we're going to do, and that's what I refer to when you see the quotations and pages. You'll understand. Thanks. Mm-hmm.